CPython core developer, been heavily involved in CPython for a very long time. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting things about the Python community is we have all this stuff that's not CPython, yet uh, it's uh, perhaps not as easy to get hold of as uh, CPython itself. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is how do we deal with that software distribution problem? But I'm going to take a short detour first. And something that you see a lot about in the open source community is people talking about the adoption of programming languages and other tools that we use to think. So, proposition. Language design is the key determining factor in whether or not a language gets widely adopted. As technologists, programming language designers, we would kind of like to think this is true. We spend a lot of our time thinking about how do we make our languages better. Does real world experience actually back up this assertion? Here's some examples. These are really, really popular languages. I don't think I'm going to find anybody in this room to say, these are really great, compelling examples of wonderful language design. I'm going to hazard a guess here that maybe that proposition's not actually that accurate. So if incredibly good language design isn't the major determining factor in languages becoming popular, what is? The honest answer is I don't actually know, but I have some theories. And one of the main theories is that you've got to start with a foothold. There's got to be a reason that people want to use your stuff. And so if we take Shell, for example, well, every POSIX system, Shell's kind of the scripting language for the computer. It's like, it is how you tell, it is the fundamental unit of computer do this thing. JavaScript, it's the fundamental way we tell a web browser to do something. Um, C, cross-platform assembly code. That's where you want to use it. And then with Java, Sun basically did an all-out marketing push into the education market and into the enterprise and basically said, hey, use this stuff. Now, they were trying to fend off the Windows threat and ended up enabling the Linux threat, but oh well, <laughs> these things happen. But it's not just having a foothold. The next thing is you have to kick off the positive feedback loops. Because the thing is, ubiquity is a power all its own when it comes to language. Because when a programming platform is available everywhere, then people are more likely to rely on it. And if people are relying on it, then as a platform provider, you want to make sure they can access it on your platform easily. And if more people are relying on something, then there's going to be more interest in learning it. And so if there's more people interested in learning it, well, then there's a business opportunity there in making courses available or books available. And so if there's more courses and books available, then people are more likely to learn it, which then increases the demand for the courses and books. And if something's really widely used, then investing in making it better gives you a lot of payoff because you make all of this software written in it better. And so as the investment goes into the platform, the tools get better. And as the tools get better, people are more likely to use it because, hey, it has these great tools. And so what it can end up meaning is that if you actually gain that initial foothold and these positive feedback loops get started, the quality of the starting point doesn't necessarily make that much difference. However, getting to the starting line is still really, really hard. It's like getting across that marketing chasm from the early adopters to the majority. It's just not an easy thing for any technology to do, let alone new programming languages. Now, one of the big factors, uh, blessing, the blessing of a high profile platform vendor, so Microsoft with Visual Basic and C Sharp, Apple with Objective-C and Swift, or even Sun with Java, can make a huge difference in getting uptake. Um, but it doesn't even have to be that big. So PHP kind of has an entrenched place in the modern computing world, and that's definitely not going to win any language design awards. But just the mere fact that it was the one that early web hosting providers offered by default is enough to have earned it a place in the modern computing environments. So, but these are all still programming languages. I think there's an even better example of this process in action. Office productivity suites. Spreadsheets are a terrible programming tool. You can't unit test them. You can't do code review on them. Their version tracking is really, really bad. But I'd still be willing to bet 
that more data analysis done with Microsoft Excel than in every single programming language on the planet combined. Maybe not by data volume, but by number of analysts. So, and the thing here is that spreadsheets make a task like adding up a series of numbers really, really simple. No programming language really comes close. And then from there, you can kind of, in that environment where you've got started, you can kind of actually grow out to a full-fledged application within your spreadsheet. This is a really bad idea, but people do it all the time. And the thing about that is that even professional software developers can't maintain complex spreadsheets properly. We didn't invent things like unit testing, code review, source control for fun. We invented them because we need them to actually maintain software properly. And if, you're, if your application is in a spreadsheet, none of those tools work. And so we can't maintain them either. Um, and yet, because of that initial foothold of the office productivity suite, the low barriers to entry, and then the positive feedback loops of companies like um, of the Office Tool Suite vendors having an interest in keeping companies buying their stuff, there's a heck of a lot of effort that has gone into making those useful, productive environments for people to get stuff done. So what do I think all this means for Python? Well, we already have footholds in a massive array of domains. It's like we have a presence in system orchestration, Linux system administration, scientific commuting, financial analysis, education from elementary all the way, elementary all the way through to tertiary, artistic endeavors, especially animation. The footholds are there. What we need to figure out is how do we kick those positive feedback loops into high gear? How do we take this vast array of technology we have in the Python community and make accessing it, getting access to it, as simple and easy as opening up a spreadsheet program, loading up a CSV, clicking a few buttons, and producing a pretty chart. What can we do about that? Well, software distribution. This is an unsolved problem, and I don't just mean in the Python community. I mean in software engineering in general. Software distribution is really, really, really hard. As operating system vendors, we struggle to provide good packaging and deployment experiences for developers that solely focus on our platform using our recommended and specifically supported programming languages. That, is a, that alone is a hard problem. So, so in the professional software development world, we have to constrain this problem to try and solve it. We make language specific tools, we make platform specific tools, we make domain specific tools. That's how hard this problem is. The general case is extremely difficult to solve. And so what, what you end up with is redistributor networks, where different redistributors serve different parts of the user base. And this is where we come back to CPython. CPython is what I consider the Python community's most successful product. And the thing that makes me judge it that way is users have a vast array of options for getting their hands on CPython. And they can get it in ways that are convenient for them. Now, some users really, really value control. They want to know exactly what they have on the computer. Well, for them, they can go grab the actual source code for Python and build it themselves. They can grab the tiebull, they can get it great straight from Mercurial, they can get it through a Git mirror. Other users, yeah, they just want to download and run something. Well, they can get a binary download from python.org. So we publish binaries for Mac OS X and Windows. Um, every Linux distribution through the system package manager, you'll be able to install Python. And that goes for both community and commercial distros. Uh, on Mac OS X, the operating system comes with Python. Um, and then beyond that, there's various package managers for Mac OS X as well. So you can install it through Homebrew, Fink, Macports, that kind of thing. Uh, in addition to that, there's commercial redistributors. So you could get your Python from Enthought, you could get it from Continuum Analytics, you can get it from ActiveState. Or maybe you don't want to install it locally at all, maybe you just want to run it online. Google App Engine has Python, Heroku has Python, OpenShift has Python. Or maybe you don't want a general purpose programming environment, maybe you just want Python. Well, Python anywhere, Wakari. Do I want, maybe you want it on iOS, well, install Computable or I, uh, Python for iOS. There's Chrome Native App that lets you integrate it with Google Docs. 
Um, or maybe you're not really interested in Python at all. Maybe what you're actually doing is animation. And the only reason you're using Python is, well, Blender and Maya 3D say, well, if you want to script it, here's a Python engine. And so this gives, it basically means that the users can get CPython the way they want to get it. And redistributors are not the enemy. It's like users really, really like redistributors. We try to offer them consistent interfaces. We try to offer them integrated software that plays well, plays well together. And so in the Python world, we extend the overall reach of the Python community to folks that are never going to go to python.org and download a binary, let alone download from source and build it themselves. But we have a problem. Most of our redistributors tend to be domain specific. And so we tend to only offer a subset of packages that fit our domain. So Linux distros, we're really interested in the system orchestration and admin space. And those are the kinds of packages we tend to offer. And so if you want data analysis packages, particularly if you want up-to-date ones, your distro package manager is possibly not going to have them because we're not playing in that space. But at the same time, if you go to one of the scientific vendors and grab their Python distros, well, that'll have all your data analysis packages. But if you want to use Kerberos, well, that package probably isn't going to be there. That meant that, uh, and so, and so, collaborating across domains then becomes unnecessarily difficult because depending on which channel you're in will affect which packages you can easily get hold of. And so, to try and improve this, we really, really need to focus on the user experience, providing users what they want, when they want, how they want. And so what this basically means is that if users have an existing redistributor that they like, that kind of becomes a design constraint on us. On us. We need to figure out how do we get them the software they want through the channel they already prefer. But in the cases where users don't have a preferred redistributor, we have a bit more freedom. We can say, hey, look, here's a community preferred default uh, distro that you can use because you don't have a preference already. This is a really, really complicated problem to try and deal with. And so the Python Packaging Authority is something that was created originally by the authors of the PIP and virtual env tools. And, and that was basically just they wanted a name to reflect the fact that the same group of developers were maintaining these two tools. And so they picked the Python Packaging Authority. Now, a bit over a year ago, what I actually suggested was that's a pretty cool name. It's a shame to only use it for two tools. So how about we make this the home for all of the projects that are working together to pr improve the Python packaging ecosystem? And so today, if you go look at the PyPA repos on GitHub and Bitbucket, you'll find not only pip and virtual env, but you'll also find the, py the software that powers the Python package index, uh, the software behind the wheel format, setup tools, the Python launcher for Windows, disklib, the Bandersnatch mirroring client, the Python packaging user guide, and the drafts of the Metadata 2 uh, PEP standards. And so, and yeah, and basically the progress that we've made in, a, in the last year, I, I think in large part due to the fact of recognizing that we're all in this together. It's like, this is a really, really complicated problem. It's got a lot of moving parts, and that the moving parts need to work together rather than compete. So, and so if anyone's really interested in learning more about that, one of the key things we're working on is uh, packaging.python.org as a one-stop shop to not necessarily have all the data, but figure out a way for users to figure out, oh, this is where the data is. These are the preferred ways of doing things. And so one of the things I tend to emphasize in PyPA is that we, what we really want to do is we really want to work with our distributors rather than against them. And the default tools are designed with that in mind. So the aim being that if we get this right, redistributors, if they so choose, will be able to automatically convert the entirety of the Python package index to their preferred format. That's a key focus of what we're doing with Metadata 2. 
It's like we tighten the constraints up on PyPI, clean up a few weird glitches where just we just allow strange things like like a object wrapper may be a valid version in theory. Um, make it more expressive so we can clearly express things like dependencies and dependencies that are only there for testing versus those that are needed at runtime, those that are needed at build time. While at the same time ensuring we have the escape hatches that we need to deal with the fact that Disutils was invented in 98, and so we've got 16 years of legacy packages on there, not all of which are going to fit nicely into this cleaned up new world of automated analysis. Um, and so managing that transition plan becomes a very important thing. Um, and so yeah, and so these are kind of the four, four of the biggest projects on the upstream side, like the, the side where we're playing nice with the redistributors. Uh, because one of the things we learned from the Disutils2 experience is that if a proposal doesn't have a workable transition plan of how do we get from here to there when we already have 45,000 packages on PyPI, um, yeah, getting setup tools involved was a key thing because an awful lot of software currently builds with setup tools and so any new metadata standards we come up with, setup tools has to be able to generate them. Um, and so this is where having everybody collaborating within part, as part of the broader Python packaging authority umbrella is key to actually making it work. Uh, one of the other things is that the automated conversion goal does drive up the complexity of the upstream design. It's like, it's a mu much simpler problem to just say, well, you know what? we're going to completely bypass the redistributors and try to go direct to users. That works for a certain subset of users, those who are early adopters interested in open source for its own sake. And that's, that's a reasonable way to go on a reasonable escape hatch. But it doesn't give us the same reach that CPython has. CPython's reach comes from the redistributors. And so if we want to extend the same reach to other components like Cython, we really, really need to be able to get it into the redistributor channels. And so that's a big part of what we're doing upstream on Disutil SIG, and I encourage anyone here who does work for a redistributor to come join us and actually try and make sure that what we're doing upstream actually does feed into the redistributor channels properly. Because those of us who are there now, we tend to be Linux focused and figuring out how to feed into Debian and Fedora uh, and then hence on into the derived distros from there. But yeah, so this is a key part of what we're trying to do. And yeah, really, a lot of this comes down to politics and commerce. It's like, as redistributors, we serve a purpose. But we're also, many of us are also still commercial operations. What we ship and support, it's going to be driven by what we want, not really by upstream goals. So, switching hats here. I'm talking a bit as a Linux vendor there. Um, but this is open source. So the community doesn't have to go through the redistributors if they don't want to. We do have the option of going around. And so that actually can sometimes break the price signals a bit because as a redistributor, if, I, if somebody who is a customer of our stuff goes, oh, I want this other piece of open source software, it'd be kind of convenient if I could get it through the redistributor, but they don't offer it, so I'll just go get it from upstream. Well, the redistributors missed the fact that, hey, they want this other stuff. We could offer it to them and make their life easier, but we don't even know they're getting it. They're, they're just going straight to upstream and going around us. And that kind of can make hard life hard when you're working for a redistributor and you're saying, hey, customers really like this stuff. We should provide it. Not going, your marketing team's going, we don't have anybody asking for it. You're going, yeah, because they're getting it straight from upstream. And in terms of getting redistributors to do things, pretty much the most powerful combination that exists in the world is engineering saying, we want to do it, and customers saying, we want you to do it. Um, it's really hard to go past that. It doesn't always work, but it's still a pretty compelling combination. So, so yeah, I encourage you, if you have a commercial redistributor and you're using upstream stuff as well, tell your redistributor. Say, hey, it'd be cool if you could help us with this problem. But 
distributors, we can't solve everything. It, it's the case of upstream moves really, really fast, and one of the things we do is we kind of try and slow it down a bit and make it a bit easier to consume. Uh, but at the same time, it means that people occasionally just want to go, well, I like most of your stuff, but this one thing, I'd really appreciate a uh, newer version of it. And so within, a, within an existing Python installation, Pip and VirtualEnv can handle that. That, that. They can say, okay, for this task, I'm going to grab this newer version of this package here, uh, and we'll run with that. What Pip and VirtualEnv can't do for you is they can't manage versioning and updating the, run uh, the Python runtime itself, and they can't ma really manage the external dependencies. Uh, so, and they especially can't do this when you don't have admin rights on the machine. And yet, that's a problem for the Python community because for us, Windows is a major market. It's like 35 million installer downloads a year from python.org alone. Uh, before this talk, I asked some of the redistributors if they would be willing to share their redistributor numbers with me. Um, Continuum got back and yeah, more than half of their customer base is on Windows. And so this kind of creates a problem for the Python community, which Disutils Dis was originally designed on the assumption that you would have a Linux distro there to deal with the external binary dependency problem. Yet a lot of our users don't have that. So it would be kind of convenient if there was a cross-platform, completely open source tool that worked much the same way on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS X could be used to manage the Python runtime like any other package, because one of the big things that unlocks is if you want to get PyPy or Jython at this point, it's kind of hard. So it would be nice if there was a tool that made getting those as easy as getting CPython. Um, it would be really nice if we could manage arbitrary external dependencies, which this audience knows more than most about. Um, and the other thing is we really want it to be able to use even if you don't have admin access on the machine. And so this is where we get to Conda. So Conda solves a different problem from the, pips, from the problem PIP solves. So it's an open source project originally created and released by Continuum Analytics. And what it does is it trades reduced integration with the operating system for more consistent cross-platform behavior. And so it becomes a really valuable option for end users that are just looking for a user-level installation that works cross-platform and independently of the system Python, if there even is one. Now, as a redistributor, this is less interesting to me, except from a competitive threat point of view. But as a Pythonista, this is great, because what this offers is the chance to give users the ability to have a consistent cross-platform user experience that lets them grab the entire scientific Python stack, that lets them manage their Python runtime with the same tools that they use to manage their Python packages, that makes it easy for them to get hold of alternative uh, interpreter runtimes like PyPy and Jython. That's amazing. That, that's a really, really important capability. Now, Conda's its own organization. It's not technically part of the Python Packaging Authority. And that kind of makes a lot of sense because Conda's not Python specific. That's why it can manage the runtimes. That's why it can manage the uh, why it can manage the external dependencies. It really is a cross-platform platform. But it's a cross-platform platform that was built by Pythonistas for Pythonistas. And so it not only handles the scientific Python stack out of the box, but it's also designed to transpar operate, interoperate transparently with PIP and PyPI so that even if, even if a Python package hasn't been built explicitly for Conda, you'll still be able to install it from uh, PyPI normally. And so essentially you have access to the whole of PyPI um, as well as to the Conda components like the Python runtimes and so on and so forth. So that basically gives us the two pieces of the puzzle that we have PIP and virtual env and all that kind of thing, which is the redistributor friendly. We, we'll, we'll play nice with all of the channels. We'll work upstream to try and get the entire, as much of the Python ecosystem as we can available through every distro channel while also having 
the ability to go around the redistributors and tell end users, hey, look, if you just want the whole thing without having to wait for the distribution channels to catch up, you can just grab Conda and do things that way. And having that, having both of those options available to us is incredibly powerful. Um, at this point, though, I'm not just a Python core developer. I'm not just a uh, member of the board of the directors for the PSF. I also work for a Linux vendor. And we're not completely blind. We're aware this is a problem for upstream communities. It's like Python has this problem, Ruby has this problem, Perl has this problem. Everybody has this problem of the distros are too slow. The thing is, we're kind of slow on purpose because one of the things we do for our users is we act as curators and gatekeepers for the open source ecosystem. Open source is inherently attractive to early adopters. It's like the entire internet is out there. We can go grab whatever we want, drag it down to our machines, and play with it. There's no guarantee it's going to be any good. There's no guarantee the stuff that works today is still going to work tomorrow. And when you, go, when you just go to a project's website, you don't know anything about what's their commitment to backwards compatibility. What's, are they actually going to still be here tomorrow? How many people are actually behind this? Like, what's the likelihood that it's just going to fall in a heap after eating my machine? Um, the, the stuff we do in open source is, from a security perspective, often kind of scary. It's like, uh, yeah, pip install Python nation. Uh, and uh, yeah, re rethink, reconsider what what, how much trust you're placing in the Python package index uh, when, you, when you type those commands. Uh, we're relying a lot on the good intent of others. Um, and so one of the purposes redistributors solve, and particularly the Linux distros, is we help bridge that gap to more conservative users that are a bit more paranoid. Um, and but, but, and the, this is a problem we face as redistributors, even the most conservative user will occasionally go, well, hang on, I want a more recent, like the stability is great and all, but I'd really like a more recent version of X. And we're like going, well, we can't give you a more recent version of X because that will break Y. Um, users don't like that answer. And that's where we get all this stuff of how do we go around the redistributors. Um, but, it's one of those things, it's getting to the point where more and more we cannot ignore this problem. And so we need to do something about it. We're trying. It's like, yeah, Fedora has 15,000 packages that depend on Python. Debian has around 16,000. The Python package index has 45K. So that's a huge amount of software that users cannot get through their system package manager. And the other thing, too, is that even if you can get a package through the System Package Manager, there's often no guarantee that it's actually up to date, unless it's a commercially supported one. And so this can kind of end up leaving users in a bad place. They have to either ignore all the software that their preferred redistributor doesn't have. A lot of them actually take that option. That's the whole redistributed reach problem. Uh, they can decide to abandon their platform tools entirely, and even if they're otherwise happy with them. That's the early adopter solution. An awful lot of early adopters just say, yeah, we'll just bypass the distros completely. Um, or the other thing that people do is they'll say, well, I'll try and get that bit from the distro and I'll add these other bits on top from the community channels and kind of have a weird hybrid of the two. All of those three are reasonable options in different circumstances, but this is also the problem that the Linux distros, we're trying to address now from the distro side and actually better support these different ways of working. So, Linux repos, making it easier to publish software in, for system, Linux system package managers. Um, so Ubuntu, quite some time ago, came up with the notion of personal package archives, which is as part of their launchpad service, they make it really, really easy to publish your own app repositories. That, that you upload your source package, they take care of the whole building process, and then you can just give people the PPA uh, URL. And Fedora's basic, we basically said, that's 
a good idea. We should, we, we should do something similar. And so we recently added the copper build system, so COPR. And that's essentially the same notion. Upload the source package. We'll take care of building repos, not only for Fedora, but also for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CentOS. And so, for example, as of last week, if you want to, if anybody here wants to play around with matrix multiplication in Python, like the syntax, and is using Fedora, uh, Slavic, the Python maintainer for Fedora and Pharrell, now maintains a copper instance which has Python 3.5 nightlies. And so you can do, you can configure that repo, do yum install Python 3.5, and it will install that software for you and you can actually play with it. And so the, the idea here being that we want to make it easy for people to use the system package manager if they want to, without having to wait for us to, get around, to, to actually integrate packages into the distro. Um, and then similarly, or with Fedora 21, we're aiming to take this, which comes out in a few months, we're actually aiming to take this notion a step further with the idea of the Fedora Playground. And so what, in the Linux distros, we have a whole bunch of really quite strict rules about how software is packaged. And what those rules are aimed at is, they're aimed at making systems easy to maintain. And so we require that stuff that needs to be backed up goes into var, we require that config data, be in slash, etc. Uh, we require that uh, packages go in different kinds of data, goes in different kinds of places. All of those rules are there for a reason, and they're there to make the system administrator's life easier. Not every system is a production server for a Fortune 500 company. Those rules are wonderful if you're if you're the sysadmin for that company. They're far more annoying if you're a user just trying to get some cool stuff on your local desktop. Uh, and that's what Fedora Playground is aimed at addressing, which is pack making packages available which are licensed such that we can redistribute them, but don't meet our standards for production servers. And what that means is that, for instance, something like Chromium, you'd be able to do yum install Chromium while if you had the Fedora Playground enabled, but on a production server you wouldn't have access to it because it doesn't meet the packaging policy rules. And that kind of is aimed at giving us the best of both worlds where for desktop machines where users are just playing around with their own stuff and they're not hugely worried about sysadmin requirements, enable Playground, have access to all this stuff. If you're on a production server and you want to lock it down and be far more conservative, well then don't enable the Playground. Um, and the idea here being to, to better balance the needs of those two starkly different communities. Um, and similarly, along those lines, uh, another tech we're working on is this thing called software collections. Software collections can basically be thought of as virtual end for the system package manager. And the Red Hat's interest in it is we we like being able to provide a really, really long-lived, stable base for people to build other stuff on. Uh, the problem is that there is stuff in that base, like, say, Python, where people are running stuff in the system Python when they're just because it's there, not because it's really a good idea. And so what the aim is with software collections is we want to make it easy to provide newer language runtimes, newer databases, newer web servers, in ways that don't interfere with the versions of those that are integrated in the operating system. Uh, and so this is the thing that lets Slavic provide Python 3.5 nightlies for Fedora without interfering with the system install of Python 3. And so this is a community based around softwarecollections.org. Um, now, because it was started by Red Hat, the initial tooling is currently RPM specific. It's like we need it to work with RPM, so those are the tools we built. The way software collections actually work should be applicable to any system package manager. Um, but yeah, anyone that wanted to apply this on a Debian type system would need to do some additional work to get it to play nice with that. Um, so however, this is a technology that 
is currently being aimed mostly at web developers and, uh, and uh, the web environment. But I think it's one that may be applicable to the scientific Python community as well. And so if people start exploring it, freaking at it, poking it and saying, yeah, this works, that doesn't, there's actually a real opportunity here to influence how that upstream community evolves and the direction the project goes. And so that gives a certain, software collections give a certain amount of isolation from the operating system, but is still integrated fully with the system package manager. There's a different problem that basically goes for a higher level of isolation again, and that's actually trying to make the entire execution environment portable. Now, this problem that the scientific community has of how do we have reproducible analysis environments that can be moved around, that, uh, that allows not only a scientist to reproduce their own work later, but someone to independently reproduce the work that went into a paper, well, there's kind of an equivalent of that in the soft professional software development world. And what we want is we want to be able to take our development environments, our software integration environments, our testing environments, our pre-release staging environments, and our production environments, we want them to be as consistent as possible because it's really, really annoying when something passes quality assurance in the testing environment and then you put it into production and it breaks anyway because something was different. Uh, yeah, we really, really hate that. But the thing is, this is not actually a solved problem in general. This is one of the great unsolved problems in software engineering, as we keep trying to find ways to do this more cost effectively. And it is essentially the same reproducibility problem that the scientific community has, which is how do we reproduce in production the same environment that we had in testing? Um, so one, one approach that the professional software development world has taken to try and solve this is the platform as a service offerings. But the problem with platform as a service is it's generally very, very specific to stateless web applications and you pretty much have to set out to use platform as a service from the start because it really affects, or currently, they really impact the way you build your application. Uh, virtual machines are a far more flexible approach that are far less opinionated about how you structure your code, but they're really kind of resource hungry, and you also have the problem of having to keep an entire operating system inside your machine image up to date. And so, people may have heard of a technology called Docker. And so Docker is a thing, well, in the Linux world, one of the most prob promising ways of tackling this reproduction problem is application containers which an application container is basically designed to be kind of like a virtual machine, but without the operating system part. The, the, it's, you use the host operating system to do most of the heavy lifting, and you just kind of have an environment that looks isolated and clean, but is still running on a host. And Docker is pretty much just a way of making that a bit easier to work with. And, Defi defining some rules for how to run them, how to manage them, all that kind of stuff. And so this tech is what professional software developers are looking at using to try and get our local testing environments to match the way we deploy stuff. And the bit I find interesting about this from a scientific Python perspective is that this technology doesn't work really well for graphical user applications yet, but it works really well for web services, things that expose network ports. <laughs> Something that runs, exposes network ports is the back end for IPython Notebook. And so you could potentially use this tech to deploy a fully configured IPython Notebook kernel environment, which you then connect to with your local web browser. And so the container then becomes a matter of instead of having to tell people, I'll get all this stuff installed, uh, get all these dependencies built, uh, figure out how to do all these, this, that, and the other, it just becomes a matter of, here's your Docker image, run it, fire up the kernel, connect to it with your browser. And so that portability then basically gives us something we can pass around to any Linux distro um, and not have to worry about the whole thing of getting the user's system configured 
but instead just give them a pre-built environment with everything uh, self-contained. One of the things about this, though, is that Docker handles the task of running container images. It doesn't really have a great deal to say about how we say, define what goes into the image in the first place. And in the Python world, that's where I think tools like Hashdist and Condor environments can potentially be really powerful because these are things for defining self-contained environments that run on a, that, that define all the software we want to run. And for containers, you need a tool that says, this is how we're gonna build the image. And so the potential here is making the process of passing pre-configured environments around even simpler than tools like Conda can already make it. Um, and so the potential I see here is that in the, in the, the way Linux kind of grew was that Linux made its way into the commercial operations kind of through the data center. It's like system administrators installed it because it was free. They didn't need to ask permission because they didn't need anybody to pay for, pay for anything. Um, and so what I, the potential I see for Python is that we can potentially do the same thing. Or in, in fact, we have already done it. We have done the, we have actually made it into all of these companies. Every Linux installation is a Python installation. Um, Windows is a huge market on the desktop. And so we have the broad adoption already. What we don't have is the industry recognition. We don't have the acknowledgement that, hey, this is a huge dependency that all of these people are depending on and saying, hey, Maybe this is something we should be investing in making even better. Maybe we should be figuring out how to get PyPy into more people's hands so their Python code can run faster. And so from my point of view, this is basically a classic case of how do we make the marketing leap across the chasm between the early adopters and the pragmatists. That, and that's a leap that most open source and academic languages never make. It's like, that's a world that is still dominated by C++, Java. Uh, C sharp. It's like this is this is a market that most open source tech just never breaks into, and Python's already there. We just need to get the recognition for it and actually say, "Hey, we're here. We can help you." And so, and that recognition's starting to come. I saw recently that apparently Python's overtaken Java as the most taught language in U US introductory CS courses. We've already made our way into a vast array of companies. Uh, in the infrastructure technology world, the rise of OpenStack as infrastructure as a service is just bringing unprecedented corporate attention to bear. And so this actually represents a massive, massive opportunity for us as a community. Uh, and so from my perspective, the key piece that we really, really want to solve to make, to actually make that stick is this software distribution problem that we have achieved all we have so far with our software, infra software distribution infrastructure being in a pretty bad state. So if we can fix that problem and make things like PyPy, things like Cython, things like IPython Notebook as broadly and readily accessible as CPython itself, then the potential is amazing that, that yeah, we, we, can, we have a real opportunity here. But it's not one we'll get for free, that there is work that we need to do to actually make it happen. And one of the big things that we have at the moment is, so packaging.python.org is designed to be the one-stop shop for here is how to get your Python stuff. At the moment, there is a huge number of sections in there that are blank and a huge bunch of sections that basically just have some rough bullet points saying, we should talk about this here. Any help that people can offer filling that stuff in would be hugely appreciated. Um, another key component is just working on the PyPA tools themselves. That they, 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 many of them have a bunch of rough edges uh, and there's, there's, there's always plenty of work to go around. 
Uh, and so again, packaging.python.org has info on these, uh, or the PyPA communities on GitHub and Bitbucket uh, is where the projects live. Um, for cases where people are going around the redistributors, uh, the Condor, Condor.org on GitHub, again, has not only Condor itself, but also a bunch of the plugins uh, and recipes for installing different things. Um, and then the other big thing that we're working on at the moment is the Metadata 2.0 efforts to actually try and feed into all these redistributor channels. Uh, and again, that's stuff that could use reviews, jump in on Dishutil SIG, uh, the versioning PEP, so PEP 440 is about to come up for review uh, now that we've actually done the work to try and integrate it into PIP. Um, and so yeah, it becomes one of those things. It's a really, really exciting time, I think, for Python that there's all sorts of marvelous opportunities here. Um, but yeah, that, that it's uh, a chance for us to succeed as a community and make, make a huge impact on, uh, on, on the world. So. Um, 